All right. Thank you all once again so much for joining us today. My name is Mary Overby. I am a Missouri Outreach Manager for Small Business Majority. And today I'm going to be talking to you about um, access to capital. This is part of a larger program that we've been coordinating with Axion and other local partners uh, with our 2017 business planning series. So today we'll discuss access to Capital 101 as well as identifying your ideal client with our fantastic partner Silver Lining. Um, Deborah Novick is going to be here and speak with us at the end of the hour. So we're going to fly through the first part of this today because we really want to get into our partner presentation because it is a, just a, a really wonderful resource for you as a small business owner. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping tips. First off, we want to thank Sam's Club Giving Program. This is our seminar sponsor. Uh, this is part of a larger ongoing seminar, and they are our grant funder that helps us provide this resource to you. Additionally, um, we are going to share the slides at the end of the presentation today. So make sure you keep an eye on your inbox for that email. We'll also include in there um, email for the upcoming registration links for the next webinars in this series. That includes part two of what you're going to hear today. At the end of the month, on the 22nd of February, we'll be presenting again with, um, with Silver Lining. And their founder and CEO will be presenting with me at that time, and she'll be going over um, some of the stuff that Deborah will talk to you today in more detail. So I encourage you to come back on for that webinar and get signed up if you haven't already. Um, secondly, we are going to take questions throughout the presentation today. Um, if you want to just type those into the chat box at the lower left-hand corner of your screen, we'll get to as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation. All right, with that being said, we're just going to hop right in so we can get to the good stuff. Um, a little bit about Small Business Majority, if you're not familiar with us. We're a national organization. We are a nonprofit uh, that focuses on education and advocacy for small business. We um, do national polling to find out what's going on within the small business community, what's important to you, what kind of issues you need information on, and then we work to um, find resources to help fill those gaps for you. One of the things that came out of our national polling was this Access to Capital webinar. And our entire entrepreneurship program um, is designed to bring resources and education to small business owners and self-employed individuals on a multitude of topics related to running and growing a small business. We are located, as I said, nationally. As you can see there, we've got nine offices. I am in good, wonderful Springfield, Missouri, which I'm sure all of you have been dying to visit. And if you do so, please feel free to look me up. I'd love to have a meeting with you. All right, so here's what we're going to go through today. Um, like I said, I'm going to fly through my portion of the presentation because if you log back on on one of our other webinars, you can hear this in more depth. We're really going to focus, though, on some of the funding landscape, um, and specifically some of the alternative options that you may not be aware of or may need a little bit more information on, and then also our Small Business Borrower Bill of Rights. So why we do what we do um, is because in order to be a small business owner, you need capital. Uh, the availability of capital is crucial for you guys, for all of us uh, for startup phases, survival, and in order to grow and become bigger and better businesses. Um, inadequate access to capital continues to be a top issue facing small business. This is something that we hear over and over in our polling that we do and also when we work one-on-one -on -one and on the ground with small business owners. So the reason that a lot of this has happened, um, small business bank lending is down 20%. Banks are really more risk averse now. They have a lot more stri stricter um, underwriting standards. And so really when they look at writing lending um, access to capital to small businesses, it's a lot riskier than doing a large business loan. It costs more than writing to write a smaller loan. Um, so they normally don't like to write for less than $250,000, which puts some of us small business owners into a dilemma on how to access that capital maybe without the startup and, and the working capital. Now you'll hear me say our, us as small business owners. My husband and I are small business owners as well. Um, 
So a lot of this access to capital stuff has came from, you know, uh, issues that we have faced as small business owners. So if you hear me say us, it's not me as a nonprofit professional, that's me as a business owner talking as well. So one of the things that's really good about being a small business owner in today's landscape is that there's a lot of new options available that were never here before. Um, a lot of things available to help start a new business idea or maybe help grow your existing business. So that's where we're going to go today is to talk about a lot of that. Um, here is, you know, a multitude of the funding sources that are available. We're not going to go over all of these today just for the sake of time, um, but we are going to focus on some of the ones on that last uh, column there because those are some of the ones that are really important for you to know a little bit more about by the end of our presentation today. So when you are sitting down looking at your financial landscape, your cash flow, and what kind of credit you need in order to grow your business, there are certain things that you need to ask yourself as a business owner before you get started even. Um, you know, key, what do you need it for? Obviously, we all have a list of things that we need money for, but what's the most pressing and how do they fit together? How much do you need total? Um, lenders don't really like it when you say, hey, I just need some money. They want to know how much you need. Uh, how long is it going to take you to pay it back? So what is the current financial shape of your business? Do you have cash flow? There are certain types of financial um, funding resources that you need to have a really steady flow of income so that you can pay that back on a regular basis. Are you financially capable of doing that? And then how much collateral, if any, do you have? Um, and then are you seeking debt or equity financing? That la next to last bullet, how quickly do you need the money? That's one that really plays into some of the things that we're going to talk about later, like merchant cash advance loans and those online lenders. Um, those came about because very often small business owners need money today or tomorrow not in three months. And so that's why it's really important that we educate ourselves and know more about those lenders. So something that is very important to know about, um, and in your community you need to make sure that you are familiar with this resource, which is a Community Development Financial Institution, or CDFIs. These organizations are typically um, nonprofits. They can be banks, credit un unions, or nonprofit loan funds, and they normally focus on a specific geographic re region. Um, they raise the capital they lend, and then they get additional investing power through grants or low interest loan foundations provided by the government or banks looking to satisfy some of their Community Reinvestment Act requirements. We actually have a CDFI on with us today, Axion, and you're going to hear from Lauren here in just a little bit about what they do. Um, they are nationwide, and so they're, they're one of the few resources you have that you can actually be located many different places <laughs> and actually have access to their amazing resources. So we'll hear a little bit more from Lauren in just a little bit, and you can find out more about CDFIs. So some of the pros and cons. Oh, Lauren, yeah, no, I, you're not. I'm not to you yet. You have yeah, to wait sorry, for me. Yeah, sorry, I jumped in early. <laughs> go, go ahead. That's how excited we are today, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you want to do my part, I'd love that. <laughs> okay, so some of the pros and cons. Yeah. Some of the pros and cons of CDFIs you can see there. Um, some pros, they really do have competitive rates. When you look at comparison, especially to some of the online lenders, CDFIs can be very, very competitive. Um, and one of the big things to look at is they offer additional technical assistance and support. So you're meeting with somebody in person, they're able to really define their support for you as a business owner. Um, some of the cons, smaller value loans may not be sufficient, and they do often require uh, collateral or a guarantee. So that um, Opportunity Finance Network is down there at the bottom. There's a link to where you can find CDFIs near you. And remember, you will be getting a copy of these slides, so that will come to you in your email 
inbox so that you can actually um, look that up. Just click that link and look that up. So the SBA, most of us are familiar with the U.S. Small Business Administration. Some of you may not be familiar with the fact, though, that they do guarantee loans. The SBA itself is not a lender, but they act as sort of a backer. So they are our collateral as a small business owner. Um, two of their primary programs that are uh, really advantageous for small business owners are the Advantage and the Grow Loan. Those just changed names. So if you're thinking that maybe that's the 7A program, that was the Advantage program as of last December. And the CDC 504 was the Grow Loan. Lauren, did you go back on mute for me? Yep. I'm getting a little bit of feedback on the line. Okay, I, I should be on mute after I should have been on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, so what do you need to know about SBA loans? Um, they are very competitive, and they often have longer loan, loan terms, so that means you're going to have a smaller monthly payment. Um, and there's no balloon payment, so what you're paid at the beginning is what you're going to pay in the middle and at the end. The SBA loans are a longer process, so if you're looking for a quick turnaround time, these are not going to be what you're wanting to go for. However, even if you don't utilize the resources for lending or for guaranteeing the lending, they do have some really great resources for you as a small business owner. Specifically, um, some of their resource partners like SCORE, which is a mentoring network, the Women's Business Centers, and Small Business Development Centers. I know we have one here locally in Springfield, both SCORE and the Small Business Development Centers, and they are just a fantastic resource for small business and for the community as lar at large. So community banks and credit unions are an alternative to some of your um, larger banks. These are, you know, they're part of your community. They're normally locally owned. Um, and operated, and so they're really focusing on supporting small business because it benefits them. It, to give to their economy gives back for their economy. And they are often um, work in collaboration. You can also look at credit unions, and they are non-for-profit non financial institutions. Um, you normally have to be members, though, in order to get lending from the, the credit union. So if you do have community banks in your region, I should highly encourage you to look up either of these resources. Um, my husband and I bank through Community Bank, and we walk in and people know our name. They know our kids' names. They know how many accounts we have and which one it needs to go in. And it's, it's really nice. It goes back to the old country style banking, which is, is really nice to have. They also are a lot more lenient on us with our lending because they understand that as a landscaping business, we have ebbs and flows within our year. So it's, it's really a, a good resource. So like I said, there are some of the pros and cons, um, great customer service and personal touch and commitment to local community. Uh, cons, they do have longer application times, and they have a lot of underwriting, so maybe sometimes you won't be able to get the lending that you could if you went to an online lender. Um, they do have high hurdles that you have to go through. But there are a couple of links, again, for you to be able to look those up. So some of our alternative lenders, um, this is really where you need to start proceeding with caution. You need to do your research, be educated, and make sure and always read the fine print. Technology has greatly increased our resources and our access to resources, especially a small business, but there are a lot out there and not all of them are reputable. Um, some of them look very nice, and, but they, they're masking high rates or maybe they've got some hidden terms and balloon payments. So just be very careful when you're looking at an altern, alternative lender. So online marketplace lenders, um, can help connect you to some of the um, resources that are out there. Some of the examples of really good online marketplace lenders that we have worked with as an organization 
Um, Fundera is one of our partners that has helped us put together the Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights. Um, Prosper and Lending Club, these guys are sort of, you know, like you put it in and they help you get there. So um, if you're looking online, make sure that you, once again, just become familiar and make sure that they are focusing on transparency in their pricing and their overall process. Online cash flow lenders, this is where we start really getting into the short term loans. And these are typically used for working capital. So most of the loans go from 6 to 12 months, and they have a fairly high interest. Um, they are non-traditional underwriting, and so it is not looking at your, uh, the same credit markers that traditional lending is looking at. Loan payments can be made, paid back a variety of ways, but a lot of times it is based on daily deductions for a fixed amount or percentage of sales. So they will normally do automatic withdrawals either from your bank account directly or if you use um, an, a, a credit way, then they will take back from that. But um, some examples of these are on deck or cabbage, spelled with a K. Um, my husband and I actually have a business loan that we have secured through on deck. And we may have a, a daily payment that we pay back. Um, you have to make sure that you have a cash flow coming in in order to do that. But it's a really good way for us. We were able to purchase large equipment that was needed within a week and uh, purchase a second truck to get employees on the road. So sometimes as business owners you have immediate needs, and this is a, a resource in order for you to fill that need. Merchant cash advances, this is where you really need to start being cautious. Uh, merchant cash advances are here for a reason. They are here because sometimes we have emergencies and we need money now. Uh, merchant cash advances are the payday loans basically for the business world. So what they will do is they take a percentage of your credit card or debit sales daily. So if you um, make $500, they will take $50. If you make $25 will take $250. It's just based on that percentage. These loans are quick and unsecured, and you pay a very high price. Most of us are very familiar with payday loan places, and we understand that there are very, very high interest rates. Merchant cash advances can be the same. So just make sure that you are paying attention to their interest rates, their pricing. We understand that people have a need for this kind of resource, and it has its place in the business world. So just be very careful and proceed with caution. They should be your last resort. Um, be cautious of the deceptive and aggressive sales and advertising. Those are some of your key words there to watch for so that you can identify that this is a merchant cash advance and not a normal traditional online lending situation. You need to make sure that your cash flow is in order and really review their fees, terms, and penalties. Um, make sure that if there's any, there are any prepayment penalties, so if you're able to pay it off early, that you're aware if that's going to cost you or not. Crowdfunding is something that's fairly new, um, but is really gaining a lot of traction and popularity. And it's used by a lot of um, startups and entrepreneurs that are trying to raise funds in a non-traditional manner. They don't necessarily maybe want to go through um, a traditional SBA loan or a bank loan, and this allows them to reach out to investors, so family, friends, and then through the, you know, the Internet community at large. Kickstarter um, is a really common one. Indiegogo is very, very popular. Kickstarter has actually had more than $1 billion raised since 2009 for just a variety of topics. This is a, a really neat way to reach people before you even start a business um, and maybe give them something back. So if you are developing a product, maybe they get a, a, a sample of that product when it is created. So they help with the initial startup cost, and then they get a reward back for that. 
if you're developing a campaign like this, you really want to inspire people. What these, um, these crowdfunding sites say that the best campaigns, the one that gets the most money, are really inspiring people to donate or to invest. The reward versus equity crowdfunding, reward is where they get something back. So like I said, if they, um, you know, if they help invest, then they get a t-shirt back with your logo on it, or they get one of the records that you're making if you're a musician. Equity is where then they get you know, some of the money back, so once you make so much money. So you have to be, just be very careful and make sure that you understand those two. Okay, so as we get into the very last of mine um, with the Borrower's Bill of Rights, this is why this was developed was because predatory lending was such a growing problem and because there was a large decline in the small business bank lending. Um, if you see there on the bottom that web link to responsiblebusinesslending.org, that is going to take you to our Small Business Borrower's Bill of Rights. So this came about through a collaborative work with funders and lenders across the nation. Um, Axion was one of the lenders that worked with us on that. And along with, and actually you'll see a list here in just a minute. What the Bo Small Business Borrowers Bill of Rights says is that as a business owner, I have a right to these six terms. So I have a right to transparent pricing and terms, to non-abusive products, so there's no hidden penalties, there's no prepayment penalties, and you get assistance if you need it. A re right to responsible underwriting, um, it's going to go for what I need it. They're not trying to sell me something that I don't need. Um, the right to inclusive credit access, non-discrimination, things like that. If you go onto that website, you can actually look into these in a lot more detail, and I'm not going to go into them as much today as I normally would just for sake of time. So like I said, we can get into listening to Lauren and Deborah as they go through their presentation. Um, but you can go on and look at this. The most important thing to know about this is that lenders nationwide are signing this borrower's bill of rights. And if they have signed this, that means that they agree to abide by these, these six principles. So as you're looking for lending, you can ask them if they have signed on to the borrower's bill of rights. Or you can actually go there and look and, and see if their name is there. Um, these are some of the questions that if you go on to that website, or you can get, uh, actually find these questions and, and more. And these are some of our BBOR checklists for small business owners. So when you're talking to lenders, these are the things you can ask. Um, and those lenders that have signed on, they should have all of this very, very transparent and available for you um, in writing and record it if needed. So upfront fees, make sure you talk about that. Um, what are the payment amounts? How often will I pay? Is it monthly? Is it daily? Do I, is it seven days a week or five days a week? A lot of these questions um, are going to help you as you make plans on how to repay for any of the lending that you've received. These are the members of your Responsible Business Lending Coalition that helped develop the BBOR. Um, as you can see, Axion is on there, Fundera we talked about, um, Lending Club. And then um, these guys have all signed on to our BBOR and as well as more lenders. Now, if you go on to our Access to Capital Resource Portal, which the website is there, you can find these resources and more, as well as links to some places to where you can compare us and shop from a wide variety of lenders. So think Expedia or Priceline.com, where you're looking at multiple um, airline tickets and comparing them all. These websites or these uh, organizations right here listed on the right, sort of do the same kind of thing. They allow you to comparison shop. And if you go under our access portal, you can find those right there and links to them. 
As I said, my name is Mary Overby, and I do this presentation every other week on Wednesdays um, at the end of the month on the 22nd. I'm going to be presenting with Silver Chair again. We're going to hear from Deborah here in just a second. And then every other week in March, April, and May, and June, I'll be presenting this. Um, sometimes we'll have partners, and then other times we'll go into this information in more depth. So feel free to share uh, these links that you're going to get or connect with us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Rosenbaum. She is with the Axion US Network, and she's our Communications Manager. She helps set these partner presentations up and really connect um, people to some really amazing resources. So Lauren, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, apologies for uh, getting overexcited about my presentation. Um, I'm just going to go through um, some really broad um, details about Axion. I want to make sure that we get to our next presenter. Um, but I'll also give you some information to learn more um, after this call. So um, Axion, as Mary mentioned, um, we are a nonprofit lender. Um, we are a partnership of community development financial institutions across the United States. Um, so we're really available to business owners all across the country. Um, and what really sets us apart is that we partner with you at all stages of your business, and that really starts with the application process itself. Um, and we have loan consultants who are experts in this, and they're really there to help you make sure that you're putting your best step forward um, as, as you complete your application. Uh, we also offer business resources and training opportunities, both online and community-based. Um, and we also offer a community of support. So when you join Axion, um, you have access to, and even before you join Axion as a client, you have access to a really great community of entrepreneurs who are invested in their own success, but they're also invested in helping other business owners succeed as well. So many of our clients are coaches, um, they're mentors, they speak at community events, um, and oftentimes they'll even partner with each other on business ventures after meeting through our activities. Um, and we know that this approach really works because the almost um, the vast majority, 97% of our businesses actually succeed, um, and they remain open. So. So to learn a little bit more, um, I've listed a few resources here, and you're going to get a copy of these slides after the presentation. Um, so the best place to go to start is to go to our main website, us.axion.org. Um, and the, if you go to our general inquiries page, um, that information is going to be based on your location. Um, and so you're going to be connected with the folks who can help you, um, who can help you go through the process of applying for finance. Um, and we also have business resources, workshops, and events, and those are available to anyone, um, any business owner um, or any aspiring business owner, whether or not you're a client of ours. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Novick of Silver Lining. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. I've just come off mute. Um, Mary, maybe just type in the chat box to confirm that you can hear me. That would be reassuring. Um, so I'm so thrilled to be here, and I just want to congratulate you, Lauren. Um, that statistic is just amazing, you being able to say that 97% of your um, businesses have remained in business since your funding. That is just really a completely amazing statistic. Um, let me tell everybody a little bit about who I am and about Silver Lining and why we do what we do. So uh, we are not a not-for-profit. We are a for-profit company, but we have the mission of actually flipping the success and failure rates for small business owners on their head. It's a widely quoted statistic that 80% of small businesses actually fail within their first five years. And we want that to be completely the opposite. Instead of 80% failing, we want at least 80% to succeed. So Axion's ahead of us. But since Axion isn't funding everyone, it's still a real problem. 
And we were founded about 11 years ago by Carissa Reiniger, who will be speaking at the next webinar in two weeks. And our whole focus is on helping small business owners make more money doing what they love. So we believe that you absolutely can create a sustainable, growing, profitable, successful business with the resources you have. And we've developed some tools to help business owners achieve what they want to achieve and what they know they deserve. I've been with Silver Lining since um, 2010, and my title is the Chief Slap Expert. So um, our product is called Slap. I'll talk about that in a minute. And we have a lot of what we call slapisms, um, you know, sort of internal cute words that we use to reinforce our messages all the time. And so a slap expert is somebody who's certified in our methodology, our way of assisting small business owners, and provides one-on-one -on -one or group coaching to small business owners who um, are using our technology tools. So um, let me get started with the presentation. Um, just a quick overview of our technology. We are focused on what we call the cash flow capacity catch-22. And so what that mouthful means is that business owners tend to struggle with not having quite enough money and not having quite enough time. Either one of those resources could help them achieve more and be more successful and grow and hopefully hire more people and contribute more to the economy and to their local community, et cetera. Um, so we're here to help small business owners basically break out of that deadly cycle of never having quite enough time to make more money and never, ha never having quite enough money to, for example, hire someone, which in a sense creates time. And we've developed this five-step methodology, we call it the SLAB methodology, that helps business owners conserve those resources and break that cycle. We are going to talk today in depth about step two, but I'll just give you one minute as an overview of our approach. So the first thing is to clarify and define what we call your SLAP statement. This is a super simple statement about exactly what you do in the world, who, what you do, who you do it for, and the scale on which you want to grow. Then we help you define your ideal client. That's what we'll talk about today. The third step is to define an appropriate one-year financial goal. So you've got your big castle in the sky, where you want to be eventually, what you want to do in five years, how you're going to retire, but how much can you achieve this year? Let's set a goal that you can reach in a 12-month period. And then we help you define an action plan, literally a month-by-month -month strategy of exactly what to do to hit that one-year goal. And then the secret is to take that plan, those first four steps are basically your plan for the year, and execute that plan. So we support you week by week and month by month and quarter by quarter with accountability and encouragement and technology tools and training webinars to work through that plan and hit those goals. So um, why is step two, the ideal client, so important? So I mentioned that you're struggling with not quite having enough time and not quite having enough money. And a big problem that small business owners often have is that they spread themselves too thin. So the key message I want to share with you right now is you do not have enough time and money to talk to everyone. And if that's true, and your time is limited, and your, let's say, marketing budget is limited, your advertising budget is limited, how can you get the best results with the small amount of time and the small amount of money you have to invest in finding new customers? The second thing to keep in mind is that you don't even like those clients who require special discounts and adjustments. So something that business owners frequently do is they really will sort of take any customer that walks through the door. Anyone who says they want to do business with us, we say, great, I'm so grateful. And we maybe invent a special service or a special product package for that client, or we extend our area of expertise to accommodate a special request that they've had. And we think it's going to pay off because we'll get better at something new. Or they ask for a special discount and maybe revenue is a little slow this month and we figure some money is better than no money and so we say yes. 
And often what ends up happening is those clients are not a pleasure to deal with because they've given us a hint about that by asking for discounts and adjustments up front. Number two is when we're trying out a new service and we're doing something a little bit off to the side of our core expertise, we're not as good at it as, as our core product or service. And that means that we may not be as profitable at delivering it. And it also means that if we don't deliver excellence, it hurts our reputation. So it's something to guard against going away from your core expertise to service someone who is not your core client can actually hurt your reputation rather than reinforce and help you improve your reputation. And the last point I want to make is that the companies with the most clearly defined, the most narrowly defined ideal clients grow the fastest. And the reason for this is because if you exactly know who you want to serve and you serve that type of client over and over, you will not only develop a real expertise in solving the problems that that client has, you will develop a strong reputation for solving the problems of that particular niche client, and it will be easier for referrals to come your way because people will know exactly what you do and who you do it for. You will become known for solving those challenges for those clients, and those clients will find their way to you more easily. Okay. So, who is your customer? This is the first question to ask yourself before you create a profile of your ideal customer. So first of all, keep in mind that your customer is the person who makes the final buying decision. So it may not be the end user of your product or service. It may not be the person who reaches out to you. It's not the referral partner. It may not be the audience. So let's say, for example, you're in some kind of a content media business. Like if you, let's say you had a TV station. We're all at home watching TV in the evening, but we're not the customer because we're not paying for the programming. We're the end user or the audience. The customer of the media company is the advertiser. I had a client who wrote a blog. It's the same for her. The people who read her blog are not her customer. She certainly has to create content for those readers because if she doesn't, then she doesn't have an audience. But her customer was actually also an advertiser who advertised on her blog. And the product that she sold to her advertising customers was her audience. So she used the content in the blog, I know this language is funny, to manufacture her audience and then sell her audience's eyeballs to her advertisers. So you need to think carefully about what exactly you sell, who pays you for it, who controls the final buying decision, and that's who your customer is. And I just want to say one other thing on this point, and that is that you are definitely doing business with a person even if you sell business to business. So it says here, definitely works for B2B and B2C. So B2C is business to consumer. You have a landscaping business like Mary does. Your customer is a homeowner who has a lawn that needs to be landscaped. There are commercial landscapers. So Mary, sorry if I'm saying the wrong thing. I actually don't know which kind of customer you have. Um, but if, let's just I say do that Mary both. also We has, need to define... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so you have a yeah. problem. You have two slab statements. So in your commercial business, you also do business with a person. Even though you are, let's say, landscaping a corporate workplace campus or a hospital grounds or some other kind of commercial uh, property owner, there's still somebody who makes the final buying decision. Maybe it's the facilities manager. Maybe it's the CEO. Maybe it's the property management company's um, account services rep, right? There's somebody, a person that you do business with. And as we go through this effort of this exercise of defining the profile of your ideal customer or your ideal client, you need to be thinking about the person, the groups of people, the individual people out there who hire you, even if they work inside another business and they're not a private person in their capacity as your customer. Okay. So who is ideal? 
So keep in mind that we're trying to break the cycle of not having enough time to reach the people who can buy from us. That's the thing we're trying to achieve, right? Get more customers in the door and get to yes as frequently and easily and quickly as possible so that our business can grow. We want to waste very little time talking to the wrong people. We want to talk to the right people as often as possible because it's more fun and it pays off. So who ma what makes somebody ideal? So we think these are the four things that make somebody ideal. Number one, they value your work. And number two, they pay you happily. Now, happily, I know that's kind of a funny word, but you know you've got customers who pay their bills on time. And you've got customers who don't. And you know you've got customers who pay the bill in full. And you know you've got customers who always ask for something special or a discount or something a little extra. I call it scope creep. They, they're, they're not really satisfied with what you've delivered. The project's never quite finished. The third thing that makes somebody ideal is that they tell their friends about you and they send you referrals. They send you new business. They're like a raving fan of you and they spread the word. And the fourth thing is you actually enjoy working with them. They're fun to be around. You enjoy the challenge of satisfying them, solving their problem, whatever it is. You love having the solution that they want. So let me ask you, why would you want to work with anybody else? Time is limited. You're, you have the privilege as a small business owner of doing business with people you like. Why wouldn't you want more of those and fewer of the others? Okay, so the next thing is you've got to figure out the real characteristics of your ideal client so you can go out in the world and find that person easily and over and over. So if you think about this, I've asked you to think about who, what makes someone ideal. So if you were to make a list of every single customer you did business with last year and maybe the year before, I would put a check mark next to the ones who meet at least three or all four of these ideal characteristics. And I would look only at those people and try to figure out what the common characteristics are about those people because that's going to make it easier for you to find more of them out in the world. So not every one of these characteristics will be critical to you. Some will be negotiable and some will be non-negotiable. If you're in a business-to-business -business kind of uh, product or service, it's going to be critical that the customer you approach works in the right industry, in the right size company, in the right department. That's going to be critical. It may not be critical whether they're male or female, but it may be helpful to understand that more often than not, the customers that hire you are male or female. And this is just a matter of understanding that people do business with other people that they know, like, and trust. So the way we do business, our style of talking, our style of relating to people is just going to resonate better with some people than other people. And so if you imagine that you have a hit list, if you have a list of prospects, let's say it's got 100 people on it. You actually can't reach all 100 people at a time and, and close a deal with them, right? So you've got to decide of those 100, which ones should you reach out to this week? So the more you know about them and the more you know about the types of people who tend to resonate with you and say yes most easily would be the ones you'd prioritize. So the more you understand about the common characteristics of the ones who tend to say yes to you readily, the easier it is to prioritize your list of prospects. So after you check uh, out from your list of customers, the ones that meet three or four of the ideal characteristics, you're looking now for commonalities among the remaining list. So what gender have they tended to be, the decision makers who've hired you? What age have they tended to be? What has been their marital status, married, divorced, uh, retired, uh, not retired, excuse me, widowed, um, single, living with someone. We actually had a client who was in the sh uh, chauffeuring business and their clients were having affairs. That was their marital status. Um, do they have children? And are those children infants, toddlers, teens, or adults? Are they employed or self-employed or retired, a student, an at-home parent? What kind of 
work do they do, and how much flexibility do they have in their work, because that will affect where you can interact with them and how easy it is to get their attention. What's their job title? What's their income level? And then we ask you to figure out some questions about where they live, what kind of house they tend to live in, what kind of uh, transportation methods they use. Some of these are relevant particularly for how you might advertise to them. If they travel to work by car, then advertising on the subway would be a waste, right? But advertising on the radio might make sense. So some of these things have to do with understanding about their own characteristics and a lot have to do with where you can intersect with them. What do they do for fun? You can meet up with them there. Last thing they read gives you some insight into what they're interested in. Causes they care about. Maybe you want to support those causes. Go to those events as a way of meeting them. So these are the key characteristics to figure out. I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking I have to talk a little bit more quickly here. <laughs> so after you um, narrow down all those characteristics, you're building basically a profile of your ideal client. It says on this slide, James needs some friends, and that's because James is the name that we've given to the ideal client of Silver Lining. So what is your ideal client's name? And the reason we think it's really important to have a name is it just makes this person, this avatar, this profile very real to you. It gives you a way to speak in shorthand to yourself and your team members about your ideal client. And what we do at Silver Lining is every time we want to undertake some kind of a program, like this partnership, for example, we ask ourselves, will James be there? And it's just an easy thing for us to say. We all know what we mean. We all know who James is. We know what James cares about. We know what James worries about. And we know where James hangs out. So it just gives us a very concrete way to always be talking to each other about our own ideal client and staying focused on being in contact with James as often as possible. Okay, so at Silver Lining, we're all about taking action. Planning is good, talking is good, thinking is good, but in the end, you have to take some action. So here's what I, I, my challenge to you. Make a list of all your clients or customers who, as I mentioned before, have the ideal characteristics. They pay you happily, they value your work, they tell their friends about you and send you new business, and you enjoy working with them. From that narrowed list of your customers, find the common characteristics and demographics and create a three to four sentence profile with a name. And that gives you the basis for figuring out this important thing at the bottom of the slide. Go find that person because that's how your business will grow, is going out in the world, connecting with your ideal client, creating prospects, nurturing those prospects, and closing sales. Okay, so just quickly, a housekeeping on next steps, and then I'm going to turn it back to Mary for Q&A. But as Mary mentioned, there will be a follow-up email to this with the slides and some more resources. We're offering a free slap build. This is a contest that we're running where we would help you build for free a full slap, a full year action plan for building your business. It's a $2,500 value. We're only offering one. Um, and then the last thing I want you to know is that, if you, that you should definitely attend part two of this webinar series, the partnership between the Small Business Majority, Axion, and Silver Lining on February 22nd uh, with Carissa Reiniger, who's our founder and CEO, and I imagine Mary and Lauren will also be there. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. If you, can, if you want to submit your ideal client profiles to us, we'd be happy to look at them and help you refine them, help make sure that you've really narrowed in on exactly who your ideal client is. Um, so look for instructions on how to do that. And Mary, I'm going to pause and hand it back to you. Deborah, thank you so much. That was amazing. I know I was feverishly taking notes as, as you spoke, and I hope that the rest of you were as well. Um, do keep an eye. I've got that document available to where I've seen that. Um, there are a lot of really great resources linked in that document from Silver Lining, um, in addition to everything that you've seen with resources that will be coming in the slides. So with that, um, I'm going to have 
everybody take come off mute, my other co-presenters, so that we can answer some of these questions that have came through. I appreciate the questions you've got, but feel free to send some more as we get started here. Um, the first question that we're going to talk about is with um, the business plan. So I need help with the financial section of my business plan. SBDC was not very helpful. Um, score question mark. So I'm going to let Lauren take this because CDFIs are a really great resource when you're doing this kind of planning. Lauren, do you want to answer this for us? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, CDFIs are definitely a great resource in this. Um, I know that our loan consultants really um, are there to sit down with you and, and really go through your business plan um, and, and make sure that you, again, put your best step forward um, a great place to find CDFIs is the Opportunity Finance Network. They have a CDFI locator. Um, and of course, if you go to us.xdion.org, um, our contact information is there as well. So um, you might have a lending office in, you know, in your own community, um, and you can also you know, contact the online lending team as well. Um, I'd also say a couple other resources um, that might be available to you are women's business centers um, that, are, that are there specifically for bi women business owners. Um, and then the Small Business Administration has um, a mentor protege program. I'm not sure like, how long it takes to, to actually get paired with a mentor, but it's definitely a good place to look in addition to, um, as this person asked, uh, score business mentors. So. I don't know if other folks have ideas as well. Um, the SCORE Mentor Program, it really just depends on how many mentors are located within your community and that have made themselves available specifically for that topic, and then how many business owners are requesting a mentor. So it's going to be different in every community um, and, and depending on industry. Um, I'd say that I would add to what you've said, Lauren. Additionally, if you're using an online lender, a lot of times they have people that are going to be dedicated specifically to your account, much like a CDFI does, that could help you with those resources on the planning. And then going directly to the lender, if you're working with a, with a bank or a community bank, their lenders there are um, natural resources for helping develop those financial sections. Okay, um, Deborah, I've got a question for you here. It says, will lenders ever ask for information on my ideal client? Um, you know, so I have to say, I don't have a huge amount of experience with lenders, so I don't know if they will, but I would say that just as a matter of presenting yourself as a smart business owner who can make good use of your resources, the more you know about your ideal client, the better it will be. The better it will reflect on you, the better results you'll get out in the world. Um, and so I don't know if they would use exactly those words. They might say, you know, what's your niche? They might say, what's your specialty? They might say, who are your, what customer groups are you going after? So they may not use the same language that I'm using. Um, I certainly think they would be smart to ask you about that because it, it gives insight into how well you understand your business and how likely you are going to be to succeed. But I don't know, as I say, whether they'll ask you that question specifically. I do see another question here I'd love to answer, Mary, if you don't mind. Go for um, it. Somebody has written in that their ideal client is the government. And so just like I said that in a business-to-business -business business, you do business with a person, I would uh, challenge you to be a lot more specific about who in the government needs. I have no idea what this uh, webinar attendee does, obviously, that just says that their ideal client is the government. But um, I think you can get a lot more detailed about the types of agencies. Is it regional government? Is it state government? Is it federal government? Is it a particular department? Is it a staffer or a politician? Is it a particular, uh, you, you need, I would suggest you get a lot, lot, lot more specific about what parts of the government and what specific person within those parts of the government is likely to need what you offer. Um, 
because the government is a huge, huge uh, entity. It's a many, many different entities. And I think to crack into it, you're going to want to be a lot more specific about who you need to approach to win some business from the government. Um, and yeah, this is Lauren. I can add to that. I would say if your ideal um, client is the government, the first place that I would say that you go, and maybe you've already looked into this, is um, is to figure out what set-asides, what, what contracting programs you might be eligible for. Um, so I used to work for a veteran-owned small business, um, and they actually were certified through the government as a service-disabled service veteran-owned small business. Um, and so that made them eligible for specific contracts that other types of businesses weren't eligible for. Um, and that's a really great way to start as a small business. Um, so again, with that, um, that business was, um, as a veteran-owned business, they were, had a lot of contracts with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and, and maybe if you are a, a woman-owned business, um, you might have interest in, in some, some other specific areas in the government. Um, so the SBA, again, um, has a lot of information on government contracting and where to get started. Um, so I encourage you to look at that as well. Thank you, ladies. That is a lot of really great information. Um, I think it's really important for us to know how to access, but how, how to define that and how to um, narrow it down and where to go for the, that assistance. So thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. And so I'm going to address this one on here actually from the, the same person. It says, I'd like more info on what type and how much collateral is needed to help secure a loan. Um, I'd like to start off with this one because, it, you know, it, it's really going to depend on which type of lender you use and which resource you go to. So if you're going to a traditional bank versus a community bank or a credit union or a CDFI or an online cash flow or merchant cash advance, it's going to be different with each of those. And so. As you talk to your lender, this needs to be one of the questions that you have on your list to ask them. Often the type of collateral they're going to ask for is other equipment. So for us as a landscaping company, we're able to utilize things that are paid off only. So we have a truck that is paid off. That we can utilize as collateral. However, our truck that we still have a loan on, we're not able to utilize that as collateral our mowers that are paid off, we're able to use, utilize as collateral. So, uh, but small equipment such as a blower or a weed eater, we're not able to. So it really depends on what your business is and what you have available. Um, lenders are really creative and good at helping define what you might be able to utilize and how much you're going to need based on how much money you're asking for. So, Lauren uh, or Deborah, do you have anything else you want to add into that? Um, this is Lauren. I would just echo that it really depends on the lender and the type of loan. Um, I know at Axion, some of our loans require collateral, some don't. Um, so really, you know, just researching the type of loan um, is going to help you understand that. Okay. Well, once again, this is Mary Overby with Small Business Majority. I'd like to thank Deborah Novick with Silver Lining and Lauren Rosenbaum with Axion for joining us today and for presenting in our 2017 business planning webinar. Um, with that last question, I believe that's going to conclude our webinar today. Please join us on February 22nd for our other presentation with Carissa, with the CEO and founder of Silver Lining, and learn more about the SLAP plan. And make sure you pay attention to your email, fill out our survey so we can do our grant funding. And you guys have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.